Hello and welcome. If you're new to my channel, my name is Christina. And in this week's video, I'm super excited to share five fun DIY projects with you, including a entryway makeover. I'm gonna talk you through the entire process as well as the techniques. So let's head over to project one. Having recently just moved into an historic home that's 130 years old, I've been dying just to put a little bit of paint down and see if I can brighten up the space a little bit. So I really want to concentrate on the entryway. And I had taken these portraits when I first moved in. So what I've been doing is breaking down the process a little bit. So creating a mood board really helps. It helps you pull the colors you like, maybe even go online and find some inspiration photos of home interiors that kind of suit as well as for me i looked at victorian styles to see what i could do with all of the intricate details that come with these historic homes including the crown moldings and upper portions as well as baseboards and fireplaces so i wanted to see what i could create as far as some colors and ideas but for the entryway what i really like to do is just really brighten it up i wanted something a little bit formal and regal so it's just a case of tidying it up and bringing that light airiness back into the entryway again but I'll be able to go through the mood board a little bit more in some upcoming tutorials to show you really easy ways to make it less daunting to break down your new makeovers for each room. It also really helps break down the dauntingness of what to do and when to do it for each of your rooms. Anytime I've had paint sitting around for a while, because I actually had this from my previous home, so I haven't opened it in at least over a year, it's really good just to flip them upside down before you start to stir them and apply them to the wall. Sometimes the paints like to separate when they've been sitting a while, so it just kind of speeds up the process and you don't have to vigorously stir it. So flipping them upside down has always been kind of my key thing I do with most of the paint products that I use. The first thing I always stress when breaking down any room makeover is always try a sample. It's worth the extra couple of dollars. That sample pot's going to go a long way as far as not only making it less expensive, making better choices, and really breaking down because the basic value of a color is going to depend on the natural light that comes in that room. For this entryway, the only light I have is through those stained glass doors. And because they're double doors, there's actually quite a bit of light coming through here. So what I've chosen is Edgecombe Gray by Benjamin Moore, and I'm going to be using their ultra matte finish. To really help speed up the process of painting, especially rooms because they do take a lot of surface space and avoid taping everything, is to get yourself a really good angle brush. It will make a world of difference to any room makeover. I really love how the Edgecomb Grey has turned out on the wall and I think the light reflection seems to really work well for this entry space. But I'm thinking we're going to go even lighter up onto the ceiling and the crown molding. So I'm probably going to go with like an older white color versus the cream that's currently on there. First thing I decided to do was for sure paint the spindles and I've decided actually I'm going to just use the chalk paint. One of the reasons the chalk paint is going to be super helpful is A, it is ultra flat matte, number one, and it's super thick because as you can see there are layers and layers of paint on that staircase. So I went around and finished the edge comb on the walls and then as added advice you only need to use halfway up your brush. If you're painting with a wall brush, make sure that you're only using half of that space because anything above and beyond that's just going to drip. It's just going to make a mess and it's going to drive you crazy. The main reason I choose to use a wall brush is because I actually have plaster on some of the wall spaces, as you can see, and I do have drywall. 
but I personally prefer to use a brush because I feel I can get the paint on in one coat versus if I use a roller, I generally will have to go around at least twice. Always super handy to throw your brushes into a Ziploc bag when you're taking a break so it doesn't dry out. I'm going to use that Athenian black in the chalk paint and I'm also going to be using old white on my ceiling so I can do this in one coat because I don't want to have to do it twice on the ceiling. The Athenian black is doing an amazing job with one coat so I'm going to proceed on. As you can see this staircase is very very old so this is also going to help mask some of those knocks and dings that are on these older baseboards and it's also going to mask these imperfections so I'm going to add some tape lines to bring out the black that I'm going to use from where the plaster meets the drywall this will help even that out no amount of brushing or perfect line at that baseboard. The house has had too many shifts in it and the baseboards are too old. So I'm almost creating a faux line by making it look like it's part of the baseboard when in fact it's not. It's just really gonna help keep things nice and straight and equal. Because the chalk paint is super thick, I actually added a little tiny bit of water as I went along, and this actually helped made it a little bit easier on the viscosity of it, so that way it would get into those nooks and crannies. Same went with the staircase as well. Because there were so many knocks and dings on those spindles because of their age, it really helped mask it. An ultra matte paint is beautiful for making things look flatter and smoother than they actually are. Because that staircase and those floorboards are so old, it's really going to be super helpful using that thick chalk paint. Anytime I paint a room, it could be a small bathroom, it could be an entryway, it could be a full-on room, living room, bedroom, I always go by the rule of three. I pick three tones. So a light tone, medium tone and a darker tone for that room. I find it really grabs a lot of really unique dimension to your room. So now that that ultra black Athenian black is dry, you can see now that I removed the tape how much smoother the drywall to that plaster becomes now that I've created that faux line. I find when you use an eggshell or if you use a semi-gloss paint on your trims as well as you know staircases and things I understand that sometimes people feel that it's a lot easier to clean with that but you can always put a lacquer finish and still have that ultra matte look and it really does mask out to the eye all the little imperfections when you're dealing with a lot of dings on a wall or a baseboard or a stairwell case when your home is a newer build you generally will only have a drywall and your staircases, floorboards, as well as your moldings will generally not have 130 years of wear and shift. So going with those sheens and semi-gloss or eggshells will definitely really pick up the light nicely. But in my case, I have a lot of wear I'm trying to mask and also matching the historic as well as making it seem a little bit more modern in here. That's why, just based on my experience, I would advise to consider trying an ultra matte finish. It's all about what you're trying to achieve. It's not about one being right or one being wrong. It's just sometimes we need these little extra tips or tricks to kind of help us figure out what would work best based on what we're working with. I'm just trying to pair the historic of the home as well as a little bit of a modern look and still keep its antiquity. We are looking at getting the floors redone, but again, they're 130 years old, so we really want to make sure that we're doing it right. But for now, I think they're pretty good overall.
I use the ultra matte lacquer for the staircase banister as it will have a lot of traffic use. So we found this old cabinet and it's in pretty rough condition, but we really thought it might be fun to give it kind of that apothecary kind of look to it. The wood is not the greatest, it's pretty banged up and these actual knobs as drawer pulls are actually glued on. So we're going to have to cut those right off, but I think we could do something really primitive with this. My husband was kind enough to go ahead and use his Dremel to cut off those knobs, drawer pulls, so we could replace it with the new ones. And since we had to cut them off, we're going to have to go and sand all of those drawer fronts, but pretty easy, just starting off with a super hard grit like a 120, and then just smooth them out with a finer grit, say like a 220 or 300. Now, because the wood was not a heavy grade or a really fine wood, and it was actually paired a little bit differently, this is where paint can actually come in and be your best friend sometimes. Because we really like the size of it, and it's actually going to be great for storage, we thought, you know what, let's see what we could do to give it a really fun, primitive look. So what I'd like to do actually is called kind of a two-tone effect where you're going to put a color underneath a color and this is just going to create a hue effect. So what you're seeing right now is I'm just going and putting this burgundy chalk paint on and I'm going to be pretty random. So I'm only going to stick to areas like corners and edges and a few center points. But we're actually not really going to see this but there will be a hue underneath when we get to the next step. This is actually a super fun, very beginner friendly way of painting furniture and you still kind of want to give it an historic and old look to your furniture pieces. So like I mentioned, just go around in random. Now I'm going to do a cocoa color, which actually is a somewhat of a neutral, but it has a red undertone to it. So I'm just going to go around some opposed places that I haven't put the burgundy. And again, I want to create this undertone before I get to the top coat. So really, it's just going to look like a hot mess. Now I don't want the burgundy to mix with the cocoa, so really important if you're going to use a couple of tones, make sure each color you choose dries 100% before you go and put your next layer on. If it's not dry enough, you're going to end up starting to create a different tone. In my situation, it'll turn pink. Once both of those colors are completely dry, I'm now actually just going to use a tiny little bit of wax. And I'm just going to use the furniture wax and I'm going to go just around in random where I've put some of this burgundy and some cocoa. And what it's going to do is it is going to allow me some flexibility when I go to put my next layer on. When I want to pull that layer back a little bit. So I'm going to be putting this Chateau Grey, which is a grey with a bit of green. It's quite lovely and what I'm going to be able to do is I'm going to be able to pull this color back a little bit and bring back a little bit of that burgundy. Because I'd like to create a little bit of a shadowing effect with the burgundy, with the wax it allows me to seal it there so when I play with the next coat it's actually sealed on so it will not pull back when I get into that first layer I put on. Now because I'm going to be getting a little bit thick I'm going to basically be brushing on Chateau Grey, a little bit of cocoa and I'm also going to put in some olive for more depth. My brush strokes are going to be random and the paint's going to have some really thick points to it because I want to create this texture. But when I go to actually pull some of this paint back with just a moist towel, that burgundy that I originally put on will definitely be secured in spot. I really love to play around with the paint in the respect of 
just kind of stippling it together because as I mash the color tones together, they kind of intertwine together and it kind of creates this very authentic old look. The more you keep stippling with your brush, the more the paints come together and create kind of a clouded effect and a very old world look. Some of the paint will be a little bit thicker and some will be a little bit thinner and again that's allowing that burgundy to show through. Once I finished stippling all the color tones that I wanted to put as my top coat, I'm now going to go back with a moist shop towel and I'm going to go around on my edges and corners, predominantly where I applied the wax when I first put that burgundy color down. And I'm going to be pulling back the top layer and again just creating that hue of burgundy underneath all of the Chateau Olive and Cocoa. I wanted the piece to look naturally aged over time, so creating that undertone and also applying it into the top coat and then trying to pull it back a little bit. I find this is a very natural look when you kind of apply it in these layers. And for my last step for the colors, I have all this beautiful texture, so I'm just going to use an old chip brush and I'm going to use the burgundy again and just create a little bit of a dry brush on all those high points. And again, it's just going to create this really a softer hue of wear. So with a pencil and a ruler, I'm going to go and make points for my drawer pulls to be nice and even. Then we'll go ahead and use the little tiny, they're actually really tiny, and screw those in so everything will be even onto the drawers. I've already clear waxed the front drawers, but I'm going to go around the sides and the top as well as the base, so that way I can turn around now and do one of my favorite steps, which is the fly spec. So with a toothbrush, a little bit of the white chalk paint, I'm literally just going to spackle all of this little tiny little random dots. It just gives it a little bit of added age and character. And I'll use the little bit of burgundy as well just to give it some more age dots. So for a little added undertone, I'm going to go around all those drawer pulls with a little bit of the dark wax just to create a little bit of that undertone and again just a little bit more age. And all I need to do is grab a little bit of clear wax if it's a little too dark and just pull it back. So I'm sure many people can relate to these plastic switch plates and all of the switch plates in my house now are brown and I could spray paint them but I thought you know what I really want to try a decoupage on top of my switch plates. This way I can make distinct character, color and style for each switch plate for every room. But I want a nice smooth result. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a piece of decoupage paper and all the supplies, including the decoupage papers that I use, you'll find in the description box below. So I'm just going to cut it out almost exact, but I'm going to give myself about almost half an inch all the way around the switch plate. This way I can make little slits into the corners and I could fold them nice and neat and swing them around so that way the edges of the switch plate will be nice and neat. So now that I have it, I'm also going to use an X-Acto knife and that way I can cut the slits for the actual switches. For decoupage, you can use a Mod Podge, that's what I'm going to use, and I'm using a disposable sponge applicator. And this allows me to just make sure I have a nice even coat for the decoupage. If I have too much or not enough, it will create more wrinkles and air pockets. So the smoother and even you can put on your Mod Podge or decoupage uh, medium that you have, 
the better. Anything that I have been using for a decoupage, I always find it very, very helpful to have some cling wrap because as I go to smooth my decoupage out, I really want to eliminate any type of creases or folds and this allows me to do that and get a beautiful result. So you're just going to want to rub down your decoupage. This also prevents your decoupage from tearing because once the Mod Podge and the paper meet, moisture is in there and the paper is so thin, sometimes it is prone to tearing. So the using that little bit of cling wrap really eliminates that. So I'm just gonna make a tiny little slit on all four corners. So I'm gonna go and add the decoupage around the actual, because it, it's kind of rounded off on the switchblade. So it'll, I'm gonna go around with the disposable sponge and I will add a little bit more Mod Podge around those edges. Then I can go ahead and fold all the way around that switch and make it seamless. The X-Acto knife came in handy because I'm going to go and make a small little tear into the center of where the actual switches are going to be. As well as you need to make a small little tear in where the screw holes are going to be. And I'm actually going to be folding those out and doing a little Mod Podge glue around the back of the switch plate so that way it doesn't just kind of have this disheveled paper on the sides and if I go and cut it off it's actually going to show the plastic again so I'm just trying to do this in a seamless fashion so it almost looks a little bit more professional. This is a really fast quick easy way to recreate, restyle, and recycle what you already have. And you can decoupage over decoupage. So if you ever change your room style or colors and you want to change your switch plates and you've got decoupage on them, you can do it again right over the decoupage. Once I've done everything and it's all dry, I will actually put the Mod Podge on top of the decoupage again for a full and complete seal. And this way, if you ever want to clean your switch plates, you, everything is sealed and you're good to go. I recently picked up these old, old oval orientated frames with gold plated on them and I absolutely love them. But I have one that is a really badly scratched mirror so the mirror itself needs to be replaced. So I thought why not have some fun with some of these old aged looked decoupage papers and see if I can place it onto the mirror. The only problem I had was I couldn't actually remove the frame from the mirror without potentially cracking the frame or the mirror. So I'm going to have to do it kind of the DIY way, meaning I'm going to have to figure out how to make this work. So what I had to do first is cut the decoupage paper in coordinates to the exact size I needed piece by piece. I didn't want to cut obviously too much and then it was going to be too short so I just cut it by size going around slicing off exactly the exact shape I needed. Now I can get the decoupage underneath the frame of the lip but I had to be very very careful how I did this without it creasing and wrinkling on me so it was a little bit of a challenge but with some patience I was able to do this. So the key with this was lifting the paper, adding the decoupage Mod Podge underneath. So that way that medium was ready to go and slowly with the cling wrap, start to smooth down that decoupage. Now, because the decoupage paper is so thin, it was creasing on me a lot. So again, just going in very, very small sections and then also break it from middle to the edges. 
So I would bring it down, use that little bit of cling wrap, that will definitely prevent it from tearing. But as I got about three quarters of the way down, it actually did tear a little bit and it was probably me being a little too aggressive. So there is an actual quick fix to this. So if this ever happens, you can grab any of the scraps that you have from your original decoupage and try to pair out the color tones add a little bit of Mod Podge, make that correction. Make sure that that is completely dry before you use the cling wrap again on top. So that way you can continue to smooth out any of the creases and the air pockets. I went to the Vincent van Gogh image exhibit that was being held in Vancouver, Canada Centre, and it was so amazing. It was almost like being in Vincent van Gogh's paintings. So I just wanted to share a few clips of that because it was a huge inspiration to my next project. I recently accepted a challenge that was super fun with some other uh, really amazing artists from around the globe with any Salone to do a color palette uh, furniture art challenge, meaning Annie Salone picked out a color palette for us and we all chose a small piece of furniture to use that color palette and look at all the different concepts as well as art ways you could use those colors. So this was the piece that I chose to use and for the colors that we're going to be using that were chosen by Annie Sloan was Oxford Navy, Antibes Green, Old White, and Antoinette Pink. My good friend Daniel from Other Man's Treasure actually came up with this a while back and me and him did a challenge on an Ikea piece, very similar, similar rules, and it was so much fun. I do recommend if you are going to paint any old piece of furniture is to use the TSP or a really good degreaser dish soap, and that's going to remove any of the crud and grease on your piece to help it paintable and this way your paint will adhere so much better. Some of these old hardware pieces sometimes have a little tiny, uh, what I would call, there's probably a better name, but a, like a pin nail and they usually just pop out fairly easy. So it's quite tiny. So what I will normally do when I take out any of the hardware is actually to put it in a plastic bag so that way I don't lose any of those little pieces. And if you haven't used your paint in a while, which I haven't for a couple of months, slip your cans upside down and give it a really good stir. So going back to the Vincent van Gogh, I kind of was really getting orientated with how he used the colors and how he had paired the colors and noticed a lot of similarities to this particular color palette challenge. So I used it actually as my inspiration. I also wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to try to kind of look at this piece of furniture a little bit differently than I would and try to exercise other ways of painting furniture that I normally don't do. So first thing I did was make sure I had a really nice angle brush so that way I could go around the symmetry of this piece of furniture so to make some really nice clean lines so I could reposition the paints exactly where I want them. And because I'm going to be using the kind of the base of it in the Oxford Navy, this is where that brush came in super handy because as you'll notice that the piece itself has a lot of detailed wood framing. 
All of the people that had participated in this color palette challenge, I do highly recommend to visit their Instagram um, social media to have a look at some of the other inspiring ways that you can use this color palette as they're all really, really talented. And I will have their accounts in my description box below. I had an idea of what I wanted to do, but I wasn't sure how I was going to execute this. So I decided to break it down into sections. And the larger portion of this cabinet, I knew I'm going to start with that base of the Oxford Navy. So I started to just make outlines first. The interesting part about doing a color challenge like this is because you're not picking the orientation of the colors. You have a strict palette of what you're going to be using and how are you going to implement that in to the furniture and what kind of techniques are you going to use. So I was a little bit out in my left field when I first started this. So again, I decided to go about this particular project just into sections. Now, because chalk paint is a very thick decorative paint, if you want kind of that brush free, um, smooth finish with chalk paint, what I actually highly recommend is to go ahead and just add a little bit of water and that will help smooth out the paint a little bit. And especially if you use the synthetic brushes, I enjoy making added texture with the thick paint. But if you enjoy to have a little bit more of a smoother finish, I just add a little tiny bit of water or spritz a little bit of water and that will help smooth out the brush strokes. I enjoy the depth that the cross hatching method of applying the paint gives to a piece. So that's just my preferred method. What I will do when I have a lot of detail like this and there's almost what I can say ledges to the feet or the legs is to do it in small sections so your paint does not clump up and you have kind of these paint run lines. Now I decided to go ahead with that nice circle frame face on the cabinet doors with that Antoinette and I found using a small artist brush to be very helpful so that way I can kind of color into the lines here. The Oxford Navy, I only needed to do one coat, but with the Antoinette, because it's a light, light color, I had to go ahead and put at least two coats down so that way I could get a really full coverage on that dark, dark veneer. At this point into the project, I really wasn't sure how the rest of the framing was going to work. So again, I just worked into sections, but there were really defined areas to this piece. It wasn't just a box piece. There was a lot of curve to it. There was some wood details. So I just decided to go with it. And what I ended up doing is I went all the way down when I first started with the Antoinette. But as I got into it, I framed it off a little bit different. Sometimes if you're a little indecisive and you're not sure what you want to paint your piece or even what colors you want to use that's where i always stress just go with it don't ever worry because if you change your mind this paint and painting with chalk paint styles you can repaint it it's not a big deal it's okay to change your mind it's all part of the artistry of figuring out how you want your piece to look so those sides, I also, with all the wood detail and carvings, I decided to go with Antoinette. But as I got more into the project, I then turned around and changed my mind and I decided to go back to the Oxford Navy. I was thinking that I was going to paint them light and highlight them dark, but I kind of went into reverse instead. I went and, went and painted them dark and I'm going to highlight them light again. Just as you're going around some of the hinges, if you use those angle brushes, you can actually paint around them very easily. You don't have to paint over the hinges. Now, because I changed my mind and decided to paint all of the detail corners of this cabinet, I did find using that synthetic um, angle brush to be a little bit difficult with all that detail. So I swapped that out for one of those round bore brushes because it just, 
It wants to do a flat surface. It doesn't want to do a lot of detailed surface. But getting those corners and curved areas with the angle brush was a super, super big help. So one paintbrush is not better than another. It's just they have their advantage points. So sometimes it's nice to have a couple on hand when you're working with a piece that has a lot of different dimensions to it. I then changed my mind about the bottom and decided to make an old navy skirt around the legs so it kind of framed it out a little bit more. Now I want to make a plan how I'm going to implement the Antibes into the project as well as a little bit of old white. The beauty thing about this art challenge is we can orientate the colors in any which way we want. So everybody's piece is going to be a little bit different and everyone's imagination and influence is going to be a bit different. So I just wanted to play with it and see how I could create different highlights and lowlights with those two shades. And thanks to Anita at The Reworks, I have these amazing stencils. And I'm also gonna have her link in my description box below because these are perfect for furniture pieces. They're small, they're light, they're durable, and super easy to wash. And the detail is impeccable. Definitely my favorite working stencils for furniture projects. So I wanted to make even more detail to kind of match out and pair with the wood detail that was already present on the cabinet. So I started with the Antibes at the bottom and as I went up the stencil I decided to incorporate a little bit of the old white. Not so much to give it an ombre effect but just to create highlights and lowlights between the two shades. Just to add a little bit of the highlight and low light and depth and dimension to the piece, as well as using the colors. And again, this is where looking at other types of art forms, and this is where the Vincent van Gogh, on how they kind of do those brush strokes and how they implement those colors in. So again, it was kind of an inspiration to see that exhibit and then kind of work with this color palette. But I was really happy with how the faded stencil turned out. I really wanted to try my best to showcase all the colors as much as possible so when you looked at the piece you could readily see each color as bold as possible. What's really interesting about the whole color challenge is the colors are gorgeous and they do pair but pairing them together onto one piece of furniture definitely was a good challenge. So I have this curvature in where the upper and the lower part of the cabinet and because of those curves these stencils worked out really really perfect and again I got these at the reworks from Anita and I'm going to do the exact same color shading on the stencil so I'll start with the Antibes on the bottom and I'm going to put a little bit of the old white on the top. I really wanted to create a lot of fine detail finish to this piece of furniture because as a whole it has a lot of detail. So I'm going to use a little tiny bit of old white and I'm just going to lightly dry brush on all that wood detail to pop it back out again. With any type of dry brushing you want to have very very little paint on the very tips of your bristles of your brush and you're just going to lightly dust on a little tiny bit of paint and that's going to give it a nice little highlight. Because there was a lot of wood detail on this piece I decided to actually go around all the frame and actually give it a little bit of a dust of the old white just to enhance all of that extra detail. I have to admit the really fun part about the challenge was allowing myself to step out of the box a little bit and try some other different techniques that I normally wouldn't normally do on a regular basis. So it was nice to have the challenge as well as it's super fun to see what other people create using the same palette. I used a small detail brush so I could go around and do any little tidy ups and some clear wax to seal the project when I was finished.
Thank you so much for watching this week's video. And please, if you have any questions and or comments, leave me a comment in the comment box below. All the supplies in which I've used will be found in the description box below. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and notification bell. That's gonna tell you when I upload my next video. Until then, take care. I'm really looking forward to seeing you soon. Hello. Guys, city kitty. Okay, love. love. I know, I know. Yes, just give me one moment. Hmm? Can you give me a second? Thank you. Okay, go. No, kitty. Are you joining or no? Kitty? No. Don't eat the plant. Don't eat the plants. No, no, don't get mad. Go. Are you finished? Let's wait for the truck to go by.